The fire is mine. I am Daenerys Stormborn, daughter of dragons, bride of dragons, mother of dragons. Don't you see? Don't you see? With a belch of flame and smoke that reached 30 feet into the sky, the pyre collapsed and came down around her. Unafraid, Danny stepped forward into the firestorm, calling to her children. The hatching of Daenerys' dragons is one of the few moments of true magic in A Song of Ice and Fire, an event that ripples throughout the world and changes the course of destiny. House Targaryen had burned into ashes, and with the death of the dragons, magic had gone cold. Danny brought that all back into the world when she stepped out of her pyre with three baby dragons, and the world's fiery heart beat hot blood again. Daenerys has gone on to do incredible things so far, but all of Westeros and Essos are watching what she does with her dragons and power. But what if there are more eyes on the Dragon Queen? Eyes that look back through the mists of time. What if her long dead relatives saw the pyre collapse and heard the music of dragons again? An echo in dreams that ripples across time and space. This wouldn't be unusual for Danny either. From the moment she was born, all of the known world watched her. Varys helped her escape across the narrow sea as an infant and was Robert's eyes in Essos keeping her on the run. Magister Illyrio, Doran Martell, the Sea Lord of Bravos, each of Valyria's daughters had plans and watched her and Viserys with great interest. After her dragons are born in the flames, every city and power she meets tries to take what is hers for their own. Some go after her children, other her hand in marriage, and the Undying want all she has. They all see her and imagine how all she has and is could be their own. Would it really be that surprising if a similar thing was happening in the world of magic and dreams? Unreliable Visions The Targaryens are a family cursed with the gifts of prophecy and dragon dreams. From Rhaegar to Maester Aemon to Egg to Daron the Drunkard to Daemon the Second Blackfire, all the way back to Daenys the Dreamer, their family can see days yet to come. Some can see more clearly than others, like Daenys who saw the Doom of Lyra years in advance and on whose dreams House Targaryen fled the Freehold. Daron the Drunkard as well who saw the death of Baelor Breakspear in Duncan the Tall's arms, and much more. But he had one dream that lit the imagination of his family on fire. The return of the dragons. Egg lowered his voice. Someday, the dragons will return. My brother Darren's dreamed of it, and King Ares read it in a prophecy. Maybe it will be my egg that hatches. That would be splendid. We learn as well that Daemon the Second Blackfire dreamed of eggs hatching and dragons returning at White Walls, which gives us an important part of these dreams, self-delusion. Daemon believed that he would be hatching a dragon and that he would raise the banner of House Blackfire and finally take the Iron Throne for his father. A dragon will hatch? A living dragon? What, here? I dreamed it. This pale white castle. You, a dragon bursting from an egg. I dreamed it all. Just as I once dreamed of my brothers lying dead. They were twelve, and I was only seven. So they laughed at me. And died. I am two and twenty now. And I trust my dreams. Dunk was remembering another tourney, remembering how he had walked through the soft spring rains with another princeling. Many of these dreams are often understood even by those who receive them, misidentifying the people or symbols in the dreams, and sometimes the time frame. A problem we see in the current the Song of Ice and Fire books as well, notably through Melisandre, who sees much and understands little. 
her major misunderstanding is Stannis Baratheon as Azor Ahai Reborn, but there's a particular vision that makes me laugh every time I read it. Whenever she was asked what she saw within her fires, Melisandre would answer, Much and more. But seeing was never as simple as those words suggested. It was an art, and like all arts, it demanded mastery, discipline, study, pain. That too, Relor spoke to his chosen ones through blessed fire in a language of ash and cinder and twisting flame that only a god could truly grasp. Melisandre had practiced her art for years beyond count, and she had paid the price. There was no one, even in her order, who had her skill at seeing the secrets half-revealed and half-concealed within the sacred flames. Yet now, she could not even seem to find her king. I pray for a glimpse of Azor Ahai, and R'hllor shows me only snow. She keeps asking for Azor Ahai, and the flames continually shows her Jon Snow. You can almost see the fire god on the other side of the flame, rubbing his temples, wondering why this red woman keeps asking the same question. More seriously, though, in that quote, George lays out the imprecise nature of future sight from one who claims to be an expert in that art. Self-delusion, ego, preference can easily lead those with the gift astray. If you want to see a bald grump on the Iron Throne, you will. The most accurate seers are the ones who don't add personal bias. They merely report what they see and let everyone else decide what it means. Prime example of this is the Ghost of High Heart. What she sees is undeniably visions of the future, yet in highly symbolic forms. Sansa Stark's poisoned hairnet at the Purple Wedding becomes a maid with venomous snakes in her hair. The death of King Renly by Shadow Baby becomes a shadow with a burning heart butchering a stag. We the reader have the benefit of knowing that these come true, such as Catelyn's POV inside Renly's tent. People in the universe do not have that ability, and as such these visions can easily be misinterpreted like Melisandre does. Collective Dreaming With the uncertainty and dangers of prophecy well established, let's turn back to Daenerys and her emerging from the pyre. The Targaryens are famous for their ability to see visions, particularly in their dreams. I explored their exact impact on the current timeline with my Aim in the Dreamer video, link in the description. Before the death of the dragons though, their dreams were rather hard to pin down to one main topic. Daenys dreamed of the Doom of Illyria, all 14 volcanoes erupting at once and ending the Freehold in one day. There's others like the prince that was promised who would defeat the darkness in some way. However, after the death of the last dragon in 153 AC under the reign of King Aegon III, their visions became far more focused. All at once, the Targaryens began paying attention to dreams of the dragons returning. In Crowfood's daughter video, titled Baylor the Blessed, she argues that the Targaryens were seeing the dragons much earlier than anyone previously thought. The King Baylor was reacting to dreams and written prophecies about the return of the dragons when he made his uh, puzzling decisions about the burning of books, not having any heirs locking his wife and sisters in the Maiden Vault, among others. This trend becomes especially pronounced among the children of King Makar I. Besides Prince Daron, each of the brothers dreamed of the return of the dragons. Aegon at first believed in Daron's visions, presumably after he saw them come true. Our Maester Aemon, as well, tells us of what he sees in his dreams to Samwell Tarly. I see their shadows on the snow, hear the crack of leathern wings, feel their hot breath. My brothers dreamed of dragons too, and the dreams killed them, every one. Sam, 
We tremble on the cusp of half-remembered prophecies, of wonders and terrors that no man now living could hope to comprehend. Eamon, though, appears to lack detail about what his dragons are doing. His gift may not be as strong as Daron's. The same seems to be true for Aegon and their elder brother, Arian Brightfling. All the brothers at one time sought the return of the dragons, and each had their own dragon eggs they tried hatching. The sisters as well, presumably. They shared a dream, although only apparently Daron remembered most of it. This kind of collective dreaming is something that is well known in fiction, and sometimes in the real world. If you haven't read fellow handsome moderator and Maester Monthly co-host Bookshelf Stud's excellent essay, Ripples in the Dreamscape, Gurm Shows His Hand, I highly suggest you do. In that essay, Bookshelf talks about how across all the books, people are dreaming and seeing Euron, a sea of blood and towers. And that all these dreams are seeing the same event, although it's unclear exactly what it is on purpose from our author. However, Bookshelf thinks that all these vague images add up to Euron sacking Old Town and calling Krakens from the deep in an eldritch apocalypse, and maybe some old ones marching out of a Lovecraft story and into Old Town Harbor. To quote his essay, Euron's black tide is about to crash down, probably on Old Town. My bet is we'll get one more Aeron chapter with some horrible, terrible mass sacrifice at the end of the chapter. Then, after Aeron's chapter, which, like Kat's last chapter, will probably end with him having his throat cut, we'll likely get a chapter from Sam showing something abominable approaching Old Town. Like I said though, this idea is one Martin is pulling from other sources, in particular the works of H.P. Lovecraft, and The Call of Cthulhu stand out as an example. In The Call of Cthulhu, people all around the world begin experiencing the Dark God's return in their own ways, and through their own mental lenses. Some make sculptures, others write about it, and some just become hysterical as the day gets closer and closer when Cthulhu emerges into the world again. In real life ancient cultures and some not so ancient similar ideas can be found. In the past dreams were sometimes thought to be messages from the gods being sent to those who could hear them. The role of symbolism and interpretation were large parts of religious life. One of George's favorite examples is the Duke of Somerset from the War of the Roses, who was told by a soothsayer to avoid castles. The Duke did just that and survived until one day when violence broke out and the Duke took refuge in the Castle Inn and ended up being killed. Or in the Trojan War when an eagle appears in the sky. Everyone who sees the eagle thinks it means something different, some seeing it as a sign of favor from Zeus or perhaps a warning. In the Iliad, ignoring the eagle is one thing that leads to the death of the Trojan prince and hero Hector, according to Homer, a punishment for his arrogance in ignoring a divine message. A much more recent example of this concept of collective dreaming happened in the end of time episodes of Doctor Who. In these episodes, creatures across time and space who are psychically sensitive have what they describe as bad dreams. Eventually, some of them, known as the Ood, show the Doctor what they see, a man laughing over and over, and that he is returning. For the Ood and many others, it is just a face laughing. For the Doctor, it is the face and laugh of his oldest nemesis, the Master, which sends the normally placid Doctor into a panic. To build tension and drama in fiction, authors sometimes make sure the only characters who can make sense of collective or prophetic dreams are the only ones who can't see them. The Children of Makar. Now, let us turn back to the Children of Makar. We never learn exactly what the circumstances of the dragons returning are, only that Daron was sure they would. However, from his brothers, we can perhaps surmise what was involved. The first of the brothers to try and bring back dragons was Arian Brightflame. Arian was a bully, a fool, 
impulsive, and a monster in the making. Had he ever sat the Iron Throne, he certainly would have brought back the cruelty of Magor. He even named his child after the objectively worst king in Targaryen history. Yet, we get these odd passages about the fiery end of Arian. The very one, though he named himself Arion Bright Flame. One night, in his cups, he drank a jar of wildfire, after telling his friends it would transform him into a dragon. But the gods were kind, and it transformed him into a corpse. Nine mages crossed the sea to hatch Aegon III's cache of eggs. Baylor the Blessed prayed over his for half a year. Aegon IV built dragons of wood and iron. Arian Brightflame drank wildfire to transform himself. The mages failed. King Baylor's prayers went unanswered. The wooden dragons burned. And Prince Arian died screaming. Arian died by drinking Wildfire, believing it would turn him into a dragon. Wildfire is George's magical version of Greek fire, a green burning substance that mimics dragon flame, and is the primary weapon of the defenders of King's Landing in the Battle of the Blackwater. Everyone puts this down to the idea of Targaryen madness. And yet, despite this, the idea of Wildfire and dragons persists beyond Arian. His younger brother, King Aegon V, died in a blaze of wildfire as well, at Summerhall. The blood of the dragon gathered in one... seven eggs to honor the seven gods. Though the king's own septon had worn... pyromancers, wildfire, flames grew out of control, towering, burned so hot that... died but for the valor of the Lord. Egg and Arian despise each other from a young age. Egg recalls a particularly horrific memory where, in an echo to Euron Greyjoy, Arian slipped into his bedroom at night and held a knife at Egg's genitals, threatening to castrate him. Egg even cheers for the death of Arian during the tourney at Ashford. Egg's legs tightened again. Kill him! He shouted suddenly, Kill him! He's right there! Kill him! Kill him! Kill him! Dunk was not certain which of the knights he was shouting to. Personally, I find it very hard to believe that Egg would copy anything from his elder brother. And yet, we have Aegon attempting to obtain dragons through wildfire, just like Arian. Although Arian believed he would turn into a dragon, the basic message between the two is the same. Wildfire plus Targaryens equals dragons. This points to a few possibilities. On one hand, we know that different characters have varying level of talent in seeing prophetic dreams. Perhaps Arians was very weak, so he only got very basic messages and images, while Egg got a clearer message. Or, Maybe Daron was the source of the information, and told one brother more than the other. It would certainly make sense. Daron has betrayed Arian before. At that same tourney at Ashford, Daron fought on Arian's side against Dunk. Well, when I say fought, I mean they uh, started on the same side. Daron purposely took a dive and lay in the mud, feigning injury to hurt Arian's chances. Arian was so hated amongst his family that when Maester Aemon lays dying in a feast for crows, he expresses he would like to see all of his siblings again in the next life, except one conspicuously left out. Will I talk with Egg again? Find Darren whole and happy? Hear my sisters singing to their children? What does this have to do with Daenerys on the pyre hatching her dragons, though? Remember, these prophetic dreams George has constructed are often symbolic and not exact in nature, except among those very gifted. While we see a girl walking out of the flames with three baby dragons, Daron and his family may have seen a towering inferno with three huge dragons erupting from them and a Targaryen in the middle of it. The important part is the underlying connective tissue between them. 
dragons, Targaryens, a funeral pyre, eggs, and one part everyone forgets, a dead king. We'll come back to that. You take Arion and Egg's actions in bringing back dragons and compare them this way, it becomes clear how although the details are discordant, the overall messages are linked. In addition, the inclusion of wildfire is likely no coincidence. While we think of it like Greek fire, it's actually a substance that is magical in nature, linked with the dragons themselves. Tyrion has this curious exchange with the pyromancer Helin. They seem to be working better than they were. Helen smiled weakly. You don't suppose there are any dragons about, do you? Not unless you found one under the dragon pit. Why? Oh, pardon. I was just remembering something old Wisdom Politor told me once when I was an acolyte. I'd asked him why so many of our spells seemed, well, not as effectual as the scrolls would have us believe, and he said it was because magic had begun to go out of the world the day the last dragon died. Their yields had increased after the rebirth of the dragons into the world, and it's apparently well known in their order. Not only that, but wildfire is extraordinarily hot once lit. The way it melts flesh, wood, even steel is very reminiscent of the way dragon fire destroys. A possible explanation is the Targaryens believed the heat was necessary for the hatching of the eggs. It is commented on in the recent release of Fire and Blood that it may be the heat of the volcano on Dragonstone that made eggs hatch so frequently. So when you see a vision of a huge funeral pyre burning extremely hot and then dragon eggs hatching, it's easy to see why both Arion and Aegon turned to the hottest burning substance known to man, wildfire. A substance that the pyromancers likely bragged, as Helen did to Tyrion, and to any Targaryen royal that would listen, that their product is connected somehow to dragons and magic. You can imagine them slapping the door to their wildfire vault saying, oh yeah, this will definitely hatch dragons. No product better for it. Wildfire is what you need to cure your dragon egg problems. Summer Hall. All we know about Summer Hall is that Wildfire was involved and most of the royal family was there, including Egg, Dunk, his children, grandchildren, and notably the about to give birth Rayella Targaryen, who was carrying Rhaegar at the time. And of course, Egg brought seven dragon eggs. Something caused the wildfire to grow out of control and kill most of those in attendance. But what if Egg was the cause? What if he tried to recreate a vision of Danny? Imagine the setup. A funeral pyre built above wildfire with the eggs in the flames. It's not working. Again, the eggs aren't hatching. But Egg needs them to hatch. There's Blackfires and the Nine Penny Kings waiting for an invasion from Essos, and Lords may be thinking about supporting them after the Crown's small folk centric reforms. Aegon V needs dragons again, and then he thinks back and remembers. He remembers the dead king on the pyre with the eggs surrounding him, and the recently pregnant Targaryen girl walking out of the flames with dragons and then sees Rayella swollen with Rhaegar. Perhaps Egg tried to throw himself and Rayella into the flames to mimic that vision. The chaos would break out, and Dunk would do everything he could to save his friend and his family. The wildfire is not to be tamed, and once spilled would engulf Summerhall, and the tragedy and grief of Summerhall rises with the green flames, all over a vision of dragons hatching. Ares Targaryen. There's one more Targaryen though who also believed that wildfire would lead to the return of the dragons. Although it's not a commonly thought of part of his persona, the Mad King Ares II. He had a vision that he told Jaime and Lannister that made Jaime become the Kingslayer. 
The traitors want my city, I heard him tell Rossert, but I'll give them naught but ashes. Let Robert be king over charred bones and cooked meat. The Targaryens never bury their dead, they burn them. Ares meant to have the greatest funeral pyre of them all. Though if truth be told, I do not believe he truly expected to die. Like Arian Brightflame before him, Ares thought the fire would transform him, that he would rise again, reborn as a dragon, and turn all his enemies to ash. The language used here is extremely important. The Mad King wanted to turn King's Landing into his funeral pyre made of wildfire. After the flames ripped through the city, killing all its inhabitants, Ares would rise again as a dragon from the ashes. George is linking here with Arian Bright Flame. Again, we are seeing the repeated messaging from Arion and Aegon. Dragons, Targaryens, a funeral pyre, eggs, and a dead king. The dead king is a part often overlooked, but Khal Drogo was also burned on that pyre. Although a cow is not a king, in the dreamy, prophetic world where Catelyn Tully becomes a fish and Baylor Breakspear becomes a great black dragon, Drogo's image could become misunderstood as well. A cow becomes a king, echoing the Targaryen words of fire and blood, and the oft-repeated line that only death can pay for life. There's power in king's blood after all. Again, easy to see how a viewer of these images might think the burning king is what unlocks the dragon eggs. And then we get back to Ares. We are told over and over that Ares is mad and insane. It's important to recognize a character archetype he inhabits, the Mad Prophet. This is an extremely well-known archetype in one of George's favorite authors, H.P. Lovecraft. Often Lovecraft would write about people who would see worlds and creatures and times no one else could around them. They would become lost in these visions and dreams. Their real lives crumble around them while they chase their grand vision. Or run from the more eldritch and horrible ones. In particular, they often see beautiful, huge white marble cities, endless idyllic landscapes, impossible structures, terrifying monsters in the deep and all around them, and sometimes days that have yet to come. Now, we turn to the world book where we get the description of the crackpot ideas a young King Ares hatched. His grace was full of grand schemes as well. Not long after his coronation, he announced his intent to conquer the Stepstones and make them a part of his realm for all time. In 264 AC, a visit to King's Landing by Lord Rickard Stark of Winterfell awakened his interest in the North and he hatched a plan to build a new wall a hundred leagues north of the existing one and claim all the lands between. In 265 AC, offended by the stink of King's Landing, he spoke of building a white city entirely of marble on the south bank of the Blackwater Rush. In 267 AC, after a dispute with the Iron Bank of Bravos regarding certain monies borrowed by his father, he announced that he would build the largest war fleet in the history of the world to bring the Titan to his knees. In 270 AC, during a visit to Sunspear, he told the Princess of Dorne that he would make the Dornish deserts bloom by digging a great underground canal beneath the mountains to bring water down from the rainwood. That white city made of marble is a dead ringer for the Mad Prophet vision from Lovecraft. This particular dream is the codex for understanding what George means for us to understand about Ares. He's been driven mad by what he sees. A second wall to the north of the current one could be in response to a dream about the imminent return of the others and a preemptive move against them. It was during Ares' lifetime that Craster began marrying his daughters and giving his sons directly to the others. The plan to make the Dornish deserts bloom could be a vision of the past before the Hammer of Water shattered Dorne and made it into the arid desert it is today, or one of the future when Dorne is a fertile grassland again. Duskendale and darkness.
In addition, we learned from Arius' past that his madness truly began after one particular event, the Defiance of Duskendale. The Defiance started as a dispute between Lord Darklin and Ares over taxes that escalated when Ares was taken prisoner and thrown in the Duskendale dungeons. He stayed in the dark for half a year until Sir Barristan pulled a Mission Impossible and personally rescued Ares from the dungeons. Imprisonment can drive people mad, especially someone already on their way like Ares. But let's take a second look at this imprisonment with the lens of Ares as a mad prophet and dreamer. We've heard the story before. Someone trapped in the darkness for a long period of time and having their third eye opened. Bran Stark spends weeks and months deep underground in the dark between the Winterfell Crypts and Blood Raven's Cave. And in those times, his powers and ability to see expands immensely and his third eye opens. He remembered who he was all too well. Bran the boy. Bran the broken. Better Bran the beastling. Was it any wonder he would sooner dream his summer dreams, his wolf dreams? Here in the chill, damp darkness of the tomb, his third eye had finally opened. He could reach summer whenever he wanted. And once, he had even touched Ghost and talked to John. Arya Stark as well experiences a parallel awakening of her abilities. While on the surface of the faceless man of Bravos, she is blinded for some time as a part of her training. And it is in this time that Arya has her third eye opened as well. Her dreams of Nymeria become stronger and more real, and she begins skin changing cats. Much like Bran, while in the darkness, Arya is learning to control and use her powers. However, we should remember from this past season of Game of Thrones when Bran sees his sisters again, how they view him. They think he is crazy, odd, strange, as he begins telling them about what he has become. As the reader, we have the benefit of understanding what he is going through. We have no such insight into Ares. And yet we know after Duskendale, his delusions and mad prophet behavior got much worse. He stopped cutting his hair, his fingernails, stopped leaving the Red Keep, didn't allow swords in his presence except the Kingsguard. He became incredibly afraid of blades in particular, and then knowing how he dies at the tip of a sword, we should maybe reevaluate what we know about Ares. Maybe he was paranoid about being assassinated after being kidnapped, and maybe betrayed by Tywin. Or, Maybe in that darkness, in the Duskendale dungeons, his third eye opened and he began seeing images of the future. Blades in the dark coming for him, a dead king on the pyre, dragons rising from it, all his friends and family betraying him. But he had no blood raven, no leaf, no Jojen, no kindly man to help him control and understand these images. So a gift turns into a poison on his mind and his kingdom. Recreating Danny's Pyre. Once again, let us turn back to Daenerys. The parallels between Ares' vision of his death and resurrection as a dragon bear a striking resemblance of Danny and the dragon's hatching. More so than Arion and perhaps Aegon. His city-sized pyre has all the elements of Danny's. A dead king burning in a huge fire, interpreting himself as Drogo. Dragons emerging from the king's body as well. Danny placed her eggs around Cal Drogo. She climbed the pyre herself to place the eggs around her sun and stars. The black beside his heart under his arm. The green beside his head, his braid coiled around it. The cream and gold down between his legs. When she kissed him for the last time, Danny could taste the sweetness of the oil on his lips. As she climbed down off the pyre, she noticed Miri Mazdur watching her. You're mad, the god's wife said hoarsely. It would be an easy misunderstanding, again, that the dragons were coming from the body of the dead king rather than the eggs placed on his chest, under his arm, and beside his head. The burning of innocents are also present in both. Danny kills and burns Drogo's prized horse on the pyre, as well as Miri Mazdor. 
You could see that as the overall message of death paying for life, which again Ares could have been imitating by playing to burn down all of King's Landing for his dragons. In addition, he had his own grandchildren, Aegon and Rhaenys, in King's Landing along with their mother Elia. There's power in King's blood. And then the eggs. This one is harder to place, but we learn that the Mad King actually did have a clutch of eggs. In the wake of Duskendale, the king had also began to display signs of an ever-increasing obsession with dragonfire, similar to that which had haunted several of his forebears. Lord Darkland would never have dared defy him if he had been a dragon rider, Ares reasoned. His attempts to bring forth dragons from eggs found in the depths of Dragonstone, some so old that they had turned to stone, yielded not, however. Put these all together, and you have what looks like someone trying to make Danny's pyre come true for themselves. A misinterpreted vision of the future. The same mistakes that people like Melisandre make, or Daron, and so many others. People desperate for the return of dragons, seizing on dreams as proof, and trying to make them come true. Across thousands of years. A final question is how long those with the gift have been seeing Daenerys and her dragons. It may be that people have been seeing her for hundreds of years, thousands of years, yet it's only after the death of the dragons that anyone really started paying attention. Although earlier I gave Daron much of the credit for seeing this dream primarily, he's not the only source. Egg mentions the other reason he believes, King Aerys I, who read it in prophecy that the dragons would return. I've previously posited that he was reading Daron's dreams, however, another possibility exists. The Book of Dreams by Danis the Dreamer, known as Signs and Portents. The Doom of Valyria she foresaw probably did not make up an entire book, well, it's believed, since no one has a complete copy, that she wrote down many more of her visions. Marwyn claims to have found three pages of signs and portents, visions written down by the maiden daughter of Aenar Targaryen before the doom came to Valyria. If Daenys was right about what she saw once, why not again? At the time, a dream about the dragons returning might have seemed foolish or one that has already come to pass. At the time of her death on Dragonstone, there were only a handful of dragons alive. Valerian the Black Dread for sure, perhaps Hatchlings, Meraxes, and Vagar, and some of the Wild Dragons. There's whispers on Dragonstone that the Wild Dragon, the Cannibal, was on the island before the Targaryens landed. After Aegon's conquest though, there's an explosion of dragons, and mayhaps to those who knew of Daenys' vision, they check that one off as true. The dragons did return after all not realizing or paying attention to the girl on the pyre part. We get another hint as well that Danny is being watched across time and space. In a fever dream in the chapter, before the hatching of the dragons, she receives a very strange vision, and that's saying something considering the rest of them, about her running past a group of unknown kings. Ghosts lined the hallway, dressed in the faded raiment of kings. In their hands were swords of pale fire. They had hair of silver, and hair of gold, and hair of platinum white, and their eyes were opal, and amethyst, tourmaline, and jade. Faster, they cried, faster, faster. She raced, her feet melting the stone wherever they touched. Faster, the ghosts cried as one, and she screamed and threw herself forward. A great knife of pain ripped down her back, and she felt her skin tear open and smelled the stench of burning blood and saw the shadow of wings, and Daenerys Targaryen flew. Wake the dragon. You could be forgiven for thinking these are just her ancestors, but the eyes tell a different story. Their eyes are the color of opal, amethyst, tourmaline, jade, and the Targaryens usually only have the eyes of amethyst or purple and sometimes blue. The colors of opal 
tourmaline and jade reference a much ancient line of rulers, ghosts from myths and legend. The gemstone emperors of the great empire of the dawn. In the beginning, the priestly scribes of Yin declare, all the land between the bones and the freezing desert called the Grey Waste, from the Shivering Sea to the Jade Sea, including even the Great and Holy Isle of Leng, formed a single realm ruled by the God on Earth, the only begotten son of the Lion of Night and Maiden Maid of Light, who traveled about his domains in a palanquin carved from a single pearl and carried by a hundred queens, his wives. For 10,000 years, the great empire of the dawn flourished in peace and plenty under the god on earth, until at last he ascended to the stars to join his forebears. Dominion over mankind then passed to his eldest son, who was known as the Pearl Emperor and ruled for a thousand years. The Jade Emperor, the Tourmaline Emperor, the Onyx Emperor, the Topaz Emperor, and the Opal Emperor followed in turn, each reigning for centuries. We know from the books and TV show that people can use skin changing and weirwood trees to see the past. In the Tower of Joy scene from the show, Bran visits the tower twice, but on his second journey he doesn't see himself standing with Blood Raven earlier. Although he does see Ned turn and react to his past self yelling out, he doesn't hear or see anything. What this establishes is that multiple, many huge amounts of green seers or dreamers could be seeing a single moment and none of them perceiving each other. While we've been told that many of these prophetic dreams are received by the dreamers, imagine if instead they are in those moments like Bran seeing them or Melisandre looking through the flames, a million faces peering into the flames, seeing another time and place. The rebirth of dragons is such a huge moment in history, one that will decide whether the world ends in ice or in fire, and if humanity has a future. Such a momentous vision may have echoed across time. It may also be that for prophecies, the longer away a particular one is, the harder it is to see clearly. Among the Targaryens who experimented with wildfire and returning dragons, there is an upwards progression in how closely they are replicating details. Ares is the closest, incorporating major parts and images in his attempt, while Arion decades earlier does a very poor job, only getting a few details. Yet, when looking backwards, the details could get uncertain or obfuscated, like looking through cloudy glass or glass candles. Ancient prophecies like the prince that was promised in Azorahai may be about Danny in the far future. Misunderstandings in an endless game of telephone, leading details to become smudged and localized and forgotten. But all cultures across the world and time seeing a girl walking out of the fire unburnt with three dragons woken from stone, with the bleeding red star overhead, and her born amid salt and smoke. <laughs>